I don't know how your social or relational needs have been going throughout this pandemic. Uh, for many, maybe especially those who either live alone or are extroverts, uh, it's been a pretty tough five months with such limited physical connection with others. Uh, we're now a few weeks into phase three here in Niagara of loosening restrictions. Hopefully some of those relational tanks are filling back up as we gradually reconnect with people we haven't been with in months. Uh, that's a good thing. I am an introvert by nature, so personally, I haven't exactly hated all of the calls to stay home and rethink crowds and gatherings. But if you're familiar with the personality profile called the Enneagram, I'm also an Enneagram 2, and so am driven to constantly want to help and love people. Which basically means between those two designations, I am deeply drawn towards people while simultaneously wanting all the people to go away. People and togetherness can be complicated. Now, there have been times in my life when I have wished very much that Christianity could be a solo sport, just me and Jesus. Like, I don't know about you, but I feel like I could be a way better Christian if I didn't have to interact with other humans. I would be peaceful and patient, much more pure and holy. Uh, I saw a poster once that said, Dear God, so far today I've done really good. I haven't gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, selfish, or overindulgent. But I'm going to get out of bed in a minute, and then I'll need more help. It's so easy to think the people and problems around us are what make it hard for us to be our best selves, right? People are the problem. Mike pointed out last week how many of those sins listed in Galatians 5 are, are sins against community, ones that break relationship. In fact, this whole passage is written to the context of community. Last week painted a picture of what our life together looks like when freedom is abused, when we just do whatever we want. You know, it ends up tearing those togetherness threads apart because our sin messes us up and other people's sin messes us up. Even simple differences mess us up. I mean, we all have different personalities, different gifts, strengths, and weaknesses different experiences, different wounds. And those things crash into each other all the time, causing friction, discomfort, offense, and worse. I mean, who wouldn't want to head for the hills? But here's the problem. Life in devoted community isn't just a side benefit or an optional add-on to walking with Jesus. Walking with each other is the walking with Jesus. We are inextricably bound to each other through the blood of Christ. And it's that way on purpose. The space between us is the place where our faith is meant to get worked out. Now, if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, you know that coming to faith is a very personal experience between you and Christ that in that moment, kind of nothing and no one else matters. But that moment is the entryway into a life of togetherness with others. For better or for worse, there is no such thing as solo Christianity. Jesus' whole heart is wrapped up in the us. The truth, that truth is even sewn right into the nature of who God is. I mean, God and God's self is togetherness, community, a, a relational trio, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's no definition of God that doesn't have a knit community at its core. And we, in God's image, are created the same. We were meant for the us. So the question is, if, if living together in healthy, right, beautiful community is essential to a life of faith, what do we do about the fact that it can often seem pretty much impossible to experience healthy, right, beautiful community? That's what Paul addresses in Galatians 5, verse 13 and 14. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, 
but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul tells us that God has given us freedom, not so that we can do whatever we want, but so that we can choose to do whatever we can to serve each other humbly in love. And he says the whole point of the entire law was simply to learn what love looks like, what justice and purity and goodness to one another look like in the details but we took it and made it something else. You know, made it a, a platform for earning or proving our own rightness. Made it a measuring stick to hold up to others and judge them and find them lacking, or at least more lacking than us. Made it a taskmaster's whip to heap shame on ourselves. But it was always only meant to show us what love looks like with skin on. Now, when Jesus came, he broke a new way wide open and invited every single one of us into it. He showed us the power of living in a different kind of spirit, where someone could take their freedom, their very life, and lay it down in love for another. And he showed us what kind of earth-shattering, system-upending, darkness-dismantling power that kind of life and love could have. And then he invited us into an adventure of releasing that same kind of love all over the world with him. And that's what Paul means when he calls us in this passage to use our freedom not to indulge our selfishness or fight for what we deserve, but to serve one another humbly in love. To so let love rule in our hearts that we freely and joyfully cast aside our own wants, even needs, our privileges and entitlements to prefer and prioritize one another instead. Paul invites us to lean with authenticity into the risk and courage and trust and humility required for true heart-to-heart -heart community, the Jesus kind, and where your rights matter more to me than mine, where your comfort and safety take precedence in my heart, where it's more important to me that you know you're loved than figuring out if I am, where I quickly and easily forgive because I know how much I've been forgiven, where I make space for your voice instead of drowning you out with my own, where I genuinely see you first before thinking of myself, and where my joy is in seeing yours come to life. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friend. And adopting that kind of servant heart is not a doormat theology. It isn't weakness. It takes incredible inner strength to lay down your life for someone else. But that's what Jesus does with freedom. And the whole reason that we can also do that, to give ourselves up so freely and fully to one another, regardless of how people sometimes squander and mistreat our gift, is because we ourselves have found in God a well of love so deep and full and so constantly replenishing that even though I pour myself out for you, I myself still never run dry. At the end of the day, Jesus did not set us free so that we could do whatever we want. Jesus set us free so that we could truly love. And so what does a community look like when people are actually living that way? Paul tells us further down in the passage, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now you could read a list like that and think that's meant to describe your personal character. 
But that's not actually what Paul is talking about right now. Here, he's describing the vibe of a community, of people living in and by the Spirit together. He's describing the space between us, a space where love is predominant. You know, it's not listed first by accident. It is the beginning and the end and the umbrella under which they all fall. It speaks of affection, of deep care and compassion, of actively preferring one another. A community full of joy. You know, not simple happiness based on circumstances, but a deep-seated soul-level contentment and celebration of all that is good around them. Of peace, which is the natural result of living in an atmosphere of love and joy, you know, free from striving and strife, from conflict and competition. Patience, which sometimes translated forbearance or long-suffering. Now, a relational devotion that is not here today and gone tomorrow, not disappearing when we disagree, but is in it with each other for the long haul. There's free-flowing kindness and goodness, you know, offering back to each other the same kind of grace-filled, tender treatment that we've received from God, always in our corner, always believing and seeing and being the best and not the worst for each other. You know, faithfulness to and gentleness with each other. No harsh or quick judgments, no biting words, no cancel culture. A community marked by self-control, where our excesses don't run wild, hurting ourselves and others. All of it a safe and sacred space for everyone to belong, to be home, to, to be free and to grow. That is what a community living fully in the spirit looks like. And who does not want to be living in the center of that? Now, it's also easy to look at a list like that and think, okay, got it. You know, that's the Jesus way, the life of love. Here is the new list of rules. But striving for these qualities like your, your daily Christian to-do list is about as effective as trying to staple an apple onto a tree branch. That's not how fruit works. Fruit isn't the goal. It's the byproduct. Fruit is the natural and inevitable outcome of a tree's inherent DNA. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you grew up in church, I'm sure you have a Sunday school song in your head right now. Those things are not the goal, the target to shoot for. They are simply evidence that the real goal is being reached. And the real goal is a deep and dynamic relationship with Jesus in and through the power of his spirit. And when that is happening, when you're genuinely living in that reality, that's just the kind of stuff that's going to spill out of you naturally. That's the inner transformation that God does. That's why Paul calls it fruit. It's the byproduct of a deeper life source. The life of God's spirit coursing through you in big and little ways when you're aware of it and when you're not. The second you turn this into your new religious to-do list, trying to prove you've got what it takes to earn or deserve God's approval with your, your goodness efforts, you cut yourself off from the life source, from Jesus. You take matters back into your own hands and you wind up back in the kingdom of yourself. So, bizarre as it sounds, we don't aim at peace, patience, kindness, or goodness. We aim at Jesus, at locking into relationship with him, at figuring out how to turn ourselves more and more over to his leading. And then the increasing and unforced outflow of peace, patience, 
kindness, and love in our lives will let us know how deeply that relationship is really taking root. And the absence of that fruit tells us something different about what's maybe not. It is the evidence, not the target. Aim at a relationship with Jesus, not a religion of goodness or even love. You know, living infused by the Spirit is what results in a life of love. But if we don't get the order right, and, and if we don't lay down our obsessions with sin, with religious rule-keeping, even self-improvement, we will never genuinely experience that life. And we will keep walking through our entire Christian experience trying to fake or force fruit that just isn't there. You don't have to work to make yourself better. That's not even your job. Our whole transformation is the result of someone else's work, the Spirit of God at work within us. Our role is just one thing. Stay as close as we can to the Spirit. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, Mike asked the question last week, how in freedom do you get people to behave without any rules? What if the answer is as simple and uncomplicated as just hang out with Jesus more and trust that he'll rub off? I mean, even social scientists tell us that over time, we actually become more and more like the five people we spend the most time with, without even trying, whether we want to or not. Keeping in step with the Spirit just means sticking close to Jesus, having a deep and interactive daily relationship, you know, regularly, regularly pulling your eyes off of yourself and putting them on to him. A relationship that grows over time, that goes in both directions. One that involves both talking and listening, and learning and celebrating and wrestling through tough stuff together. So this is not a religious rule to keep, it's just a basic relationship question. How much time are you spending alone with Jesus? I mean, do you know how to spend time alone with Jesus? Because that can sound kind of weird, especially if you're newer to faith or only used to rules. And I know he's not quite a person you can call on the phone or meet for coffee, but he is anything but out of reach. Like any relationship, it just takes practice. And our relationship practices with God are what teach us to live in the Spirit. They're how we learn to recognize His voice and His heart and how He leads. We call those spiritual practices, and we actually did a whole nine-week series on that this spring. Those messages and practice guides are still up on our website for you anytime. And you can build your own new ones every single day. Church is part of it, of course, but it's like a tiny part. Now, one hour once a week isn't a, a life-altering relationship. And that's not about rules. It just isn't enough. Real love doesn't get built like that. It takes more investment. And love is absolutely what it's all about. I think we reach so easily for rules because we want so badly to know where the lines are because we want to be good. And that's not a bad ambition. But we are something so much better than good. We are loved. And that's what we discover inside of time spent in relationship with God. That we are absolutely ridiculously loved. And if we can allow that truth to genuinely sink deep down into our bones, it will transform us in a myriad of ways. It will do the work. And that transformation, that filling with the Spirit, will take us from not only being a people who are loved, but a people who become love and who spill that out freely to others without even trying. 
And love, as luck would have it, is actually good. But it's also so much more. I said at the beginning, I have at times wished Christianity could be a solo sport. There have been seasons when that sentiment wasn't just a, a snappy quip, but a painful plea. Just let me have Jesus and leave the rest behind. But that's not Jesus. It is incompatible with who he is. And like many, maybe all of us, I only met Jesus because of the other people. It was through community. I was drawn in by the love and bubbling life I felt coming off of these weirdo church people. And I needed to know what that was. And in the space between us, I found a very real living God. And in the space between us now, I continue to find him. And that is the invitation open to every single one of us to not run away, to not cancel out, but to continue on into a lifetime journey of being wrecked and rebuilt by the love of Christ, experienced through one another, imperfect and broken as we are. Christianity is not a solo sport, and I thank God for it. It doesn't work well when we live enslaved to either sin or rules. But when we walk in the Spirit, when we allow ourselves to be transformed by His love day by day, moment by moment, as we learn how to live loved, we do slowly become love more and more and more. And that fruit begins to leak out of us wherever we go, whatever we do, whether we're trying to or not. Love and goodness will be what spills out of our lives. And people will encounter Jesus when it does. And we will encounter Jesus. And the world will change because it's impossible for it not to when the Spirit is present. So I don't know if that all sounds impossible, but it's not. The law was impossible. Trying on our own to conquer our sin obsession is impossible. This other thing, this living in the Spirit, is absolutely within our reach. It's what we were made for. But it's only within our reach together, close enough to hurt each other and close enough to heal. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the gift of who you are, for all the ways that you come to us. Would you continue to open our eyes to see you in all of the avenues of love that you pour into our lives? Thank you for the gift of each other. Thank you for a community in which to wrestle and find you again and again and again. I pray that you would continue to pull our eyes onto you, that you would fill us with your spirit so that we absolutely can walk in this life and love that you have laid out so well for us. You are a good God. We long for you. In Jesus' name, amen.